What's up, everybody? There's the mute button. How are we all doing? Um, it's good to be back. Oh, back to dropping our controller as soon as possible. This is uh, the first five missions of Stellar Assault Double S for the Sega Saturn. So just to sort of introduce... Um, so some may have already seen that uh, this was demoed, it was debuted by the Shiro Show. Our pals who were uh, a big part of our bulk slash promotion campaign in 2021. No longer last year, but the year before last. So we gave them uh, first dibs on debuting this demo on their show. Uh, and they actually did two videos. So Pat, first Pat streamed it on their usual Friday streaming day. And then da Dave uploaded a, a video um, later that weekend. So this is all... Um, previously tread ground, but uh, I just thought I would I would do it for good measure on my end as well. I can speak directly to a lot of aspects of the project since I'm the project lead, and uh, we'll we'll do that right now. This is Stellar Assault Double S, translated by fans into English. and played on an actual Sega Saturn on a burned disc using pseudo Saturn Kai Lite. I will get a Satiator this year, I just need time. Lots of expensive things have been happening. Okay, I'm gonna shut up now and let Renee talk. This is a... I'll let it go. Four years have passed since first contact. Earth, the third planet, fell under siege to an alien fleet the likes of which we'd never seen. The situation seemed dire, but to our surprise, the enemy were easily repelled, withdrawing at the first show of resistance and vanishing as swiftly as they'd appeared. Their technology had simply been no match for that of mankind. Considering the minimal damage done, there was perhaps a silver lining to the incident. The attack had unified us, bringing an end to eons of conflict over ethnic and religious divides. Afterward, we studied what we could from the wreckage of enemy ships, but there was precious little to be learned. The vessels had been outfitted with self-bricking mechanisms, making them all but impossible to examine. Then, Two years later, there was a second we'll contact. The identity of the alien menace remained a mystery, but this time, we were ready for them. Knowing another encounter was all but inevitable, we'd work together as one human race to make preparations to intercept and attack. Having only incurred minor damage in the previous clash, we'd assumed the enemy would be even easier to repel this time but the alien invaders had another surprise for us. Their once outdated technology had evolved immensely in two years' time. It was now nearly on par with our own. Had we not undergone a technological revolution over those two years, they might have wiped us out then and there. Then, as the battle descended into chaos, the enemy vanished yet again. This time, however, we were able to track them. They had performed a series of space-time jumps, consolidating their forces at the edge of our solar system. Then, with a mysterious blast, disappeared altogether. Some theorized they'd recognized their imminent defeat and self-destructed. But ultimately, we determined it safest to assume they'd escaped, leaving open the possibility of a future encounter. Another two years passed, and now they've made contact for a third time. This time, certain facets of their technology have surpassed ours. This comes in spite of humanity's strengthened coordination and further technological advances since the last contact. We no longer have the assurance we once did, only questions. Why do they attack at two-year intervals? Where did they come from? And who, or what, are they? Wow, that timed almost perfectly with the, the 
how long it took me to eat that banana. That FMV is approximately one banana long. <laughs> All right. Okay, so a couple things. So this game, I'm actually not super clear on a, a few of the features in this game. It has this fancy trace mode, which uh, supposedly it lets you record gameplay and then play it back with dynamic like cinematic camera angles. If you ever played the original Driver on PS1, it's kind of like that, except Driver let you actually cut your own, like, you know, make your own cuts and place the camera yourself so you can make your, your own little car chase movie. This, I think it does it procedurally. Cool feature. I can't really figure out how to get it to work, so I need to investigate more. You caught me off guard, Blue Moon. Thank you for those bits. Um, But, uh, so you've got difficulty levels uh i don't think they impact the ending or anything i'm just gonna play on easy so i don't embarrass myself too much um sound uh we decided as a team that currently the the ideal levels uh let me just make sure i'm not wrong there yeah as of now we're setting it to 70 70 and 100 it would be nice if we could change that default we might be able to but we need to investigate that uh, and you've got a sound test, which just uses the file names. I find that interesting. This is Hog One. Bright, Birdie. Radio so you can chip. actually listen this to all our one. all units fan out. Let's be home in time. You can for actually dinner. listen to all the VO, and I think that unlocks after you beat the game once, which I ha I've actually beaten the game twice. Once with the bad ending, once with the good ending. There are two endings, uh, and we so the criteria for um getting the the good ending uh it's a little obscure uh the criteria for getting the good ending so what we're gonna do is when we release the patch there will be a readme file as we did with bulk slash that will have some tips for maximizing your enjoyment and one of them will be listing the criteria to get the good ending and you can just skip that section if you don't want it spoiled um but uh, yeah, there's there's like three cr there's three points in the game where you have to do certain things to get it, um, and they're not hard to do, but you wouldn't know about them unless you like looked it up or something. So uh, you can actually shoot yourself in the foot as early as mission three, and then there's nothing you can do to like to undo that if once you're done with that mission. Uh, okay. Look at some of these other settings because it's cool. You have an interlaced mode, um, which I'm. I can even see on my CRT. It's making it more jittery. Um, it's it's cool that they experimented with that. I, I see no reason to use it. You can adjust the position, and then because this game displays in uh, sixteen nine, there are borders on the top and bottom, and you can actually. Customize the color. You can make it bright red if you want. I'm not gonna, but it's another feature that's just kind of cool that it exists. You know, it's a, you know they it's it's a relatively high tech game for the Saturn. I feel like they did a lot of flexing. Here's the controls. You've got two weapons per ship. There's two types of ships. Then you've got a, they call it an assault field. Um, that's your it's like a barrier, protective barrier. And then you can speed up. You can slow down. Um, not they don't say this in in the control menu, but uh, if you double tap, speed up or speed down, you can do an extra fast boost or like full hard stop. Uh, rot L and Rot R. We may look into changing these. I forget. Uh, Dan has actually changed some of these already. I forget if he messed with this screen yet. Uh, those so Rot L and Rot R. Those are uh rotate. You can rotate your ship, and then you can switch view, which I never noticed is not even secret. It's in the uh, in the control list here. But yeah, you can if you pause the game and press X, you can switch to a third person view. We just discovered this uh, thanks to a YouTube commenter on the Shiro Show show. Uh, and then you can do inverted controls if you want. Notice it says player two. That's because one of the ships supports uh, two player. Uh, it's it's the ship type B, uh, and then here's Trace. I st I still haven't wrapped my head around how all this works. 
there's a stage select buried in the trace mode stuff. Uh, and I th what it is is you can use trace mode to go to a specific stage and record a playthrough of it. And that allows you to, as a side effect, select a stage to play instead of having to go through the game linearly. But today we're just going to go through linearly. It's just going to be the first five missions. Um, I've actually been practicing with type A, although uh, it seems like the consensus is that type B is an easier ride. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with type A for now. I have beaten the game with, with type B. Um, and they, the difference is sh uh, shot, ty shot types, mobility, and um, sh type B can actually uh, shoot enemy bullets, which you can't with type A. That does help a lot. The United Nations Space Force is Earth's first line of defense against alien invasion. We've concentrated our ranks along the orbital path of the eighth planet, Neptune. This was a predictive measure based on the enemy's previous appearances near Neptune's neighboring planets, Uranus, then Pluto. Unfortunately, with this third contact, the enemy have instead emerged slightly inward of the orbital path of the third planet from the Sun, Earth. They've since dispersed into multiple squadrons and spread across the inner solar system. To make matters worse, they've quickly managed to establish a position within attack range of the Earth and have begun pelting our home planet with asteroids. <clears throat> the UNSF are heading back as quickly as possible, but at this rate, the Earth will incur catastrophic damage before they ever arrive. Ooh. Now they, they freak. And so the duty falls to us. We've assembled each nation's best and brightest at Earth Moon One and begun preparations for a joint space command. One more cutscene and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the project. The enemy is using an Excel gate to pelt the Earth with asteroids. The damage is extensive. A few more of these strikes and the environmental destruction alone will be catastrophic. Our hope is therefore to neutralize their base of operations quickly, but we don't have the intel we need. We need to dispatch a reconnaissance craft, but with the Space Command still in its preparatory stages, none have yet been deployed to our ranks. Instead, we'll conduct this recon operation using our support craft. All Feather-1 spacecraft are equipped with auxiliary mobile support pods. These are the most recon-capable vessels in our command. But as the name says, they were designed for support and are thus unmanned and unarmed. Their partner Feather-1 crafts will therefore accompany them on this mission. After the jump, all units will advance to the navigational point and conduct a scan. You are to undock from your support craft during this scan to ensure optimal response time, should any emergency arise. Once scanning is complete, redock with your support craft and withdraw. Best of luck. Okay, actually there is a little more dialogue. I'll start, I'll start getting into it when they let me actually have control. <clears throat> so that's Renee Martin, um, who was an early auditioner way back in like July and she was very patient while we deliberated over who was going to play Aya who's one of the most one of the biggest roles in the game um, and she knocked it out she was great to work with um, and you know what we've got our website this is Hog 1 Bright, Birdie, radio check loud and clear sir this marks the first field up of the illustrious Joint Space Command. Let's move out. Mission area coordinates confirmed. Initiating jump. All scan points will be displayed on your HUD. Just follow the screen. Approaching mission area. Disengaging jump drive. Here's, uh... All units, fan out. Oh, thanks, Let's be home in time for dinner. Please align your targeting reticle with the green marker. 
Okay, so uh, real quick, so that's Renee Martin. Shadow Mask just put her uh, website in the chat. Uh, Blue Moon saying she's excellent, extremely professional, high quality. We also just heard Dan Bosley as the voice of Edgar, the ship AI. Uh, and check this out. A green bar indicates a point of interest in that direction. Please align your targeting reticle with the green So marker. he's giving you a little tutorial. It's very brief. Um, and he's a real live Brit. We found an actual <laughs> English person to voice Edgar. All units have reached the scanning point. Very good. Undock your support craft and start scanning. Undocking Kite 3. Stand by on heightened alert. Kite 3. Initiating scan. All support craft have finished conducting their scan, sir. All right, let's dock them and roll back. Picking up increased kinetic activity at the enemy site. Well, guess they finally noticed. Thermal reading spiking. They're attacking. Kite 3 damaged. All channels offline. Detecting jump turbulence. No ID signals. Multiple enemy craft exiting jump. Oh, sucky. So... Oh, units, intercept at your own discretion. Time to step it up. Okay. So real quick, that's uh, Ramir Pascal von Benesset. And I'm sorry if I'm messing up your name. Uh, he's our uh, Captain Jake McPherson. Uh, and he uh, he is uh, he's been recording with us from Holland. So uh, <laughs> there's been some... Uh, time zone gymnastics but he's been really fun to work with because he's great at improvising uh and i just love his accent and his his booming deep voice uh it was exactly what i was looking for with that with that register uh so that's been a, those sessions have been a lot of fun we we have him do a lot of improv um which he excels at it's been it's been really fun i hope to have some outtakes and bloopers to share at some point <laughs> but we'll see then we've got my friend Diana Alaco, who is returning from Bulk Slash. She played Rupia Rude, a country fried navigator. Um, <laughs> and she's back uh, in this as Brenda Bright, who is your fellow pilot. She's, a, she's the same rank as you, uh, which is Ensign. Uh, and that gets into the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, which is uh, translating all these proper nouns and, and uh, military ranks, which can be quite tough. What's up, guy with the bow tie? The Burning Rangers vibe to the voices? You know, I've actually not played that game in English, so I don't know, but I, I think it... I, I have it in my head that it's one of the better Saturn localizations. Uh, let's go with that. Let's assume that's what it is. <laughs> um, so... Uh, You'll, you'll notice that in the load screens and FMVs, you see the term Synthesis Space Force come up a bunch of times. Uh, and that was the original name of uh, basically this like planet-wide, or actually solar system-wide uh, military, which you're a part of. Uh, and, th you know, this is a concept that you see in a lot of space, uh, you know, space operas and you know, stuff like Gundam and you know, there's always like a Federation army or something like that. Um, Synthesis Space Force is the English term that the Japanese creators came up with. And uh, it's always tricky when you're dealing with pre-established English terms when you're translating or localizing a game. Um, but I, I didn't like that name. I thought it sounded like it was invented by someone who doesn't speak English, which I think is probably true. Um, synthesis sounds to me like artificial. Whew. That about puts a bow on it. Detecting a large kinetic reading within enemy lines. It's an asteroid. The enemy ejected an asteroid at us through the Excel gate. Damn it! Hawk one to Garuda. We've got your enemy data, but as you can see, we've got big trouble. And I mean big. What's the plan? This is Garuda. Threat confirmed. Hawk Featherwing, use your support craft to recharge and pursue the asteroid while awaiting further instruction. Roger that, Garuda. Birdie, use my support pod to recharge. Man, should have known they wouldn't let us ease into this gig. 
So that's your intro stage. And then you see here, uh, you can, tr it's there's trace play and there's save. I don't really know. So let's just see what happens if you select trace play. In theory, this should show what I just did, but it, it's, it's blank. Now if I hit save, I can save the trace play to a slot. Now if I select it, I don't think it's gonna, and I've had, this is what usually happens for me. I'm not really sure if there's like a button you have to hold to start tracing or what the deal is. Oh, let this play out. The asteroid was launched against through the enemy's Excel forward. gate is 300 meters in diameter. If it continues to plunge toward the Earth, the damage will be immeasurable. We are now loading Falcon 1 with a resonant frequency round. Once it's ready, we, along with Eagle Featherwing, will head to your position. Meanwhile, take note of the vernier thrusters attached to the asteroid for course correction. Destroy them before we arrive. Over and out. Uh, hey, Rowan Dinkt. Rowan Dinkt is also uh, voicing a character in this game. We have yet to record it, um, but he's locked in. So anyway, synthesis is based for, and then you hear, you see here again, SSF, and then the ship name. Um, so there's still traces of those. Getting in front of this thing will be a royal pain. Sorry. Birdie, you handle the front. Me and Bright will take care of the rear. Really, Captain? You're going to make him do your dirty work just because you don't feel like it? Quiet. Captain's orders are captain's orders. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that uh, as it segues into gameplay, gets me every time. Anyway, so there's still remnants of the Japanese naming conventions, and I there's probably not much we can do about some of those because we can't edit the FMVs. Um, like we, not, I don't know if there's a, like we can edit the audio of the FMVs, but not the image, as far as I know. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that used to be a thing in, like, anime and stuff where you'd see, like, they would change the name of something, but you'd still see remnants of what it was called in Japanese whenever someone, like, sees it written down. Like, if you watch Cowboy Bebop, they've got, you've got all these janky spellings of character names that appear in the Bounty Hunter show, or the, uh, I can't think of what that show is called all of a sudden, but where, where they would inform Bounty Hunters of who was, uh, who had a bounty on their heads. So we're just kind of going to roll with it. So we went with United Nations Space Force, which feels a little more descriptive. Synthesis Space Force just sounds, it sounds like we're the robots. Um, and it's important that we don't sound that way. Uh, and then uh, the other one is um, U United Space Command, which is the, like, um, it's the elite splinter group that you're part of that's executing the mission that is this game, which is to fend off the third attack of this mystery alien force that invades every two years. So you're like the best of the best of who's still alive. Um... And, uh, United Space Command is the, is the name I came up with, and that was based on a lot of research about, you know, different military terminology based on the Japanese uh, term that they use in the first place. It's, it's tricky because it doesn't line up cleanly with any one existing thing, right? It's like an amalgam of, like, real-life military terms and stuff that's been filtered, you know, like, sci-fi influences... You know, it's space time turbulence detected. Oh, is that who I think it is? Fail to confirm ID signal. It is the enemy. Crap! <laughs> All units return fire. Don't die. <laughs> um. Anyway, so that's just some uh, insight on the uh, some of the proper nouns that we changed. Um, ranks. Space time turbulence detected. ID signal confirmed. I'm so glad they could find the time! Howdy, McPherson. Guess we kept you on ice. 
Is that Alan Virgil I hear? Ha! <laughs> You're lucky I left you some scraps. Heads up. I'm carrying a heavy payload here. I need you to cover me. Roger that, buddy. Right. Birdie. Eyes on Falcon 1. So that's Mike Dent as Alan Virgil. Rocco DeFeo as Brad Feel, your fellow captains of different uh, squadrons. Sometimes they come and help you out and trash talk you a little bit. Um, Mike Dent sometimes goes by Mock Dent, M A C H, and he's got an extensive We've suppressed the enemy vessels. resume. Roger. Launching Recently shot. worked on uh, Kamen Rider Zero. He makes videos for Shout Factory. Impact yeah, all the music in this is just fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah Bowtie, I am playing with the 3D pad. One to all units. The asteroid is smashed, but its fragments are still too long. Break formation and fire at will to demolish what's left. Over. All right, that's that. Thank you, Blue Moon. I'm glad. I'm glad you think it sounds so good. Um, that's you know we once again lucked out with uh, the talent we found, especially considering this is a completely unpaid volunteer project, and uh, we lucked out having Shadow Mask on our team who has you know, professional level expertise and know-how of audio engineering, so he's been able to smooth out a lot of the discrepancies in, uh, in audio quality and, uh, yeah, audio quality. Now, uh, speaking of controllers, uh, I am very hopeful that we'll be able to find a way to add support for the Saturn mission stick. As you can see in the background behind me, next to my stereo there. Uh, it's a flight stick, it's an analog flight stick for the Saturn that bafflingly is not compatible with what is by far the best flight sim on the Saturn. <laughs> Does anyone disagree? Can anyone there name a no better flight sim than on the Saturn? Breaching the Earth's atmosphere. Falcon 1 to all units. Mission complete. All units return to base. Double dig digit viewers with double S. It's like one digit for each S. <laughs> yeah, isn't it nice when you get to put your degree to use? I feel the same way. <laughs> but, um... Other translation stuff. Uh, military ranks are a tricky one, too, because, again, uh, this doesn't equate to any actual military. The data you scanned with your I'll support pods has provided us with detailed intel on the enemy's asteroid launch site. Hawk and Eagle squadrons will carry out an attack on this site. It is imperative that we halt these asteroid strikes. We have just one target, the enemy Excel Gate. Eagle Squadron will focus on destroying this target. Hawk Squadron, attack the battleships around the gate to dispel the enemy forces. Good luck. So Mike Dent also ha he has a link tree, which... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to see up on Twitter since they they went back on that thing about punishing people for having links to other sites on Twitter. What a what a maniacal decision that was. But anyway, uh, go check out Mike Dent. He's he's does a lot of great work. He's super fun and easy to work with. He consummate professional. Um, just gonna try and share out these links as I as I think of them. Um, so, yeah, like we, so I didn't, I didn't know this term ensign, which is the rank that we ended up using for the player character, Rob, Rob Birdie and uh, Brenda Bright, who's your fellow 
fellow ensign. Uh, but I guess this is this comes up a lot in Star Trek and I, I think Gundam also. This Hawk one to all Hawk units. We're off. Mission area coordinates confirmed. Time to jump. What's up, Crouching Mouse? You're just in time. I was just about to shout you out because that's hey, your first Bernie. line. How's that fancy new AI module working for you? Even your support craft talks now. That's right, Captain. Call me Maria. I'm Kite 3's AI module. They've even test outfitted me with an experimental emotion chip. I have my own feelings and personality. Let's be pals. Greetings, Captain McPherson. This is Edgar, Hawk 3's AI unit. Coinciding with Maria's arrival, I too have been test outfitted with an experimental emotion chip. Mine, however, has been configured to sound less comical. C comical? Robbie, tell this tin can not to be so rude. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you got a full house there, Robbie. <laughs> Captain, save the dumb jokes for later. We're coming up on the mission area. Whoops. Sounds like those two aren't the only ones with emotion chips. Captain. All right, all right. All Hawk Squadron units, break formation as soon as we exit the jump. Attack any enemy ships surrounding the gate. Arriving at the mission area, let's jump out! <clears throat> Take care of that gate, Virgil. Right, on it. Good luck. All right, so yeah, that's Crouching Mouse, who's returning from Bulk Slash, where she voiced Kina DiBiase. Am I saying that right, DiBiase? DiBiase. Um, and knocked it out of the park as Maria, who is your support craft AI module. Um, you, you may recall in the first mission, your your support pod, which is conducting that scan, gets blown up by a laser. And so they give you a new one, and, it, and the new one is fully featured and can talk and has an emotion chip. Uh, now they've outfitted my, my, ship, my main ship computer, which is Edgar, with his own emotion chip, but he's a little behind when it comes to emotional expression. Um... So there's a lot of uh, fun banter between Edgar and Maria. All right, I'm doing this all wrong. So that's the gate. But there's also these battleships. And uh, you want to go for the battleships first for reasons. Yeah, it's a it's the fun sort of juxtaposition of being hyper intelligent, but also like super moody, because she's got this newfangled chip. Whoop. And once again, just killer music. There's lots of exciting uh, like swooping flybys, you know, like swooping in and getting the last hit on a ship just before you collide with it, you know, and instead of colliding with it, you get to, like, fly through this glorious explosion. Um, and, you know, when all else fails, you do have the, the assault field, which is your force field. It, it absorbs some, but not all of the damage. I can't do that. <laughs> if we can work one in. I, t I tend to be wary of adding references where there were no references before. But <clears throat> sometimes things align. Thanos is choppy on your end? Is everyone else seeing the stream okay? Does it look choppy to anyone else? So the game, uh, it took a while to translate this one because it's cleanly... I forget, you know, Danthrax 
uh, took the time to actually count how many Japanese characters I had translated. Because first I had to transcribe the whole game by ear. Because uh, there's no text. And in a way, that's a relief, you know, compared to Bulk Slash, where we had to figure out a lot of clever uh, hacks to, to replace the text. Or more more, uh, more accurately, Dandrax had to figure out some clever hacks to replace the text. Uh, but this game is all audio. Um, so first it was transcribing, and then, uh, and then it took me a few months to translate the full script in my free time. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what the timeline was. I think I, f I finished my first pass in April. I started in like January or February. I think January uh, 2022. And then finished first pass in, in April and then we started revising. I, I did my own revision pass, and then I handed it off to Dan Drax and Cargo Din, who you may know from lots of other translation projects. She's been on a lot of translation projects. I think uh, she skews more toward PS1 stuff. She did uh, the Planet Laika. Um, she's working on the Linda Q project. And, uh, um, oh my god, I can't think. I Iblard. Really cool games. I feel like I've already discovered a lot of very cool, obscure uh, games through Cargo Day. Uh, she also had a bit part in Bulk Slash as Adult Kina, so there's a connection there. Uh, so she and uh, Danthrax uh, did the second revision pass. They gave me suggestions for revisions to the script, and I kind of collated all the ones that I liked and agreed with. Uh, which there were a lot of. There were a lot, like, they definitely made the script vastly better than it had been. Um, and in particular, you know, I don't have a ton of knowledge of this genre, you know, uh, meaning both flight sims and just, like, sci-fi space opera stuff. Um, whereas... Um, they both do. Danthrax is sort of a flight sim connoisseur, and Cargo Dan knows a lot about Gundam and other series in that vein. Um, so that helped a lot. Alright. I guess that's all the that's all the biggins. All right, now we can go for the gate. Even though Alan takes credit for destroying this in the end, and it was supposed to be his task in the first place, it's kind of a weird thing about this mission. There are other times where if you let your AI buddies, uh, meaning the the ships controlled by the game, not Edgar and Maria, but just like your like. Alan and Brad are, are controlled by the computer. There are other missions where if you leave them to their own devices, they will eventually kill the target without you. Uh, but in this one, you have to participate in destroying the gate. You have to basically do it yourself. This is the gate that they're using to uh, launch asteroids at the Earth. Which is a pretty good way to attack the Earth. You gotta, you gotta hand it to them. They're like, well, it worked on the dinos. Every time I play this game, I just think, boy, this sh the only way to improve upon this would be to have it work with the mission stick. <laughs> so I really hope that we can figure something out. 
It just seems like a glaring omission that I don't understand. There we go. I think you want to shoot the base of those things after you shoot off the tips. Bad guys are escaping! Eagle 1 to Garuda. I've destroyed the target. Remaining enemy units are retreating. Mission complete. This is Garuda. Solid copy. Eagle Squadron and Hawk Plume Wing, return at once. Hawk Feather Wing, we've got word on your next mission. Okay. No time to dilly dally, folks. Right, Birdie? You heard her. Dock with your support craft. So, uh, I don't think I knew this. I think I did and I forgot. Rocco DeFeo plays Brad Feel. Sort of a mid sized role in this game. Uh, lo and behold, he's on Twitch. So you can, uh, you can watch him on this very same platform. Check him out right there. I just feel like my voice is more high pitched than my head. <laughs> yeah, well, because you're, I feel like your character voice is considerably higher than your normal speaking voice. Um, but yeah, like, oh, let, let me, oh, I'll, I'll let this play out. Take a look at this asteroid belt between the orbital paths of Earth and Venus. Here we've discovered the supply site the enemy has been using to scavenge asteroids. They equip these asteroids with booster rockets, then guide them to the Excel gate. They've left a number of these boosters intact at the site, meaning there's still a threat of ongoing asteroid strikes, albeit at reduced efficiency. Your objective is to neutralize this supply point and completely cut off any potential for further strikes. Hawk Plumewing have resupplied and are standing by for jump. Please regroup before commencing the mission. Best of luck. Okie dokie. Um... Where was I? It's a great high quality, high pitched voice. Oh yeah, I was gonna say that like it was when we were picking Kina and also Maria, um I was very conscious of how high the risk Hog Feather Wing! All units stand by Sorry. for jump. Mission area coordinates confirmed. Ready when you are. Alright. Ready on our end, Garuda. Just say when. Roger, I'll send the signal. Still want to talk over the actors. Hawk Plume Wing reporting in. All right. As soon as we jump out, all units focus on sweeping up the enemy. Time to put a dent in their plans. Roger. Roger. Let's go. Maria, please take heed. Your vessel is unarmed. Entering the combat area will be highly dangerous. I suggest you refrain. Ah, uh, I know that. Haven't you ever heard of a joke? Hmm. I am, as of yet, unable to comprehend humor. Maria, I would like you to teach me. Humor is not something you teach. Oh, we've arrived at the mission area. And... <laughs> there we go. Up and at him. I don't want to see any cold feet. Try not to die. All right. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, though, like, with Maria and Kina, I was very aware of the high risk of the character being annoying if we didn't play our cards right, you know? Um, so, uh, we were trying to hit uh, the right balance, you know, of, like capturing the character but not making it so shrill and annoying that you wouldn't want to listen to it for a prolonged period of time. And Maria, in particular, is, is a pretty big character in the game, so uh, I think we hit it. I feel really good about it. There is a British person doing the computer voice. That's Dan Bosley, who I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, he's been great to work with, too. He has this really syrupy sounding voice. Uh, whatever mic he's using. Uh, it's got a really bold low end. <laughs> so as soon as he kicks in, like when we're just listening to clips or whatever, it's like when we have the headsets on, I get like this instant ASMR effect. <laughs> Headgear. 
keeping the pilots uh, cool headed. Yeah, two bit two bit is crouching mouse who plays Maria, um, and also played Kina in Bulk Slash. You've missed so much, Thanos. I've put in quite a bit of practice for these first five missions. The reason I picked... The reason I was intent on having a five mission demo is because mission five, I think, uh, is it's just... It's got a great set piece that I think showcases uh, some of the variety you see in this game. Because the first four missions, we're in mission four now, they're all pretty similar looking. And then 5 has this great subversive moment, um, which kind of, it, it's this startling thing that makes you realize that you don't necessarily know exactly what the game is going to throw at you. Yeah, the game gets a lot more visually diverse than you might expect. Uh, you know, from the first four missions, or if you've played other games like Colony Wars, you know, games that are sort of adjacent to this. And you guys are all doing, like, drinking heavily tonight? It's Monday. I worked all day. <laughs> the beginning of the month is reporting time for me, so I have to make all these PowerPoints and Excel docs, Excel sheets. Now I'm kicking back with some Stellar Salt Double S. So we had initially been targeting this April for a completion date to release the patch to the public. There's a chance we'll be done ahead of schedule though. I don't want to jinx it, but our pace has been very good. I mean, we already ha we're already done with like a third of the game. It's already implemented, like that's what you're seeing right now is about a third of the game. Um, there are 17 missions, um, so not quite a third. But not every mission is of equal length. Yeah, I saw that on Google Calendar also. New Year's Day substitute. I don't. I don't know what that means. No further enemy readings detected. I believe all craft have been destroyed. Do you concur, Maria? No bad guys here. They've been completely annihilated. What a bunch of amateurs. Space-time turbulence detected. Failed to confirm ID signal. Holy crap! It's the bad guys! Oh, we got a new batch! Garuda to all units. Hawk Squadron's mean energy level just dropped below 50%. It is too dangerous to remain in combat. Please withdraw at once. Aw, oh, man. Where'd you guys learn how to fight? Well, them's the brakes. All units, back to base, on the double. Roger. Roger. Okay. That's, uh, that's also Space Galaga as the uh, unnamed pilot of the Hawk Plume Wing. So you've got your squadrons, and then you've got different wings within the squadrons. So uh, it's just an unnamed pilot who comes to help you out. <laughs> which wait? Which take are you talking about, Crashing Mouse? Is it the okay? We've uncovered the enemy's frontline base of attack, located to the rear of the previous mission area. Now that they've lost the ability to carry out asteroid strikes, they'll likely use this base to launch a new attack on us. 
We oh. will therefore make the first move. <laughs> the holy crap, it's the bad guys. Our mission is to launch an all-out attack on the enemy's frontline base and eliminate the standing threat to Earth. The installation is built into the crevasse of a large crevasse. asteroid, with numerous battleships deployed in the asteroid's Very fancy perimeter. base. After arriving at the mission area, all squadrons will first launch an attack on these ships to thin out their ranks. Then, Hawk Squadron will infiltrate the asteroid by way of a short jump and neutralize the frontline base. Best of luck. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think there were, there were a lot of times where Shadow Mask and I, because what would happen is I would pick takes out and place them on a rough timeline that synced up with the Japanese and then send that over to Shadow Mask plus all of the all of the rest of the raw audio for every actor in case he had to, like if a if a take just didn't sync up right he could choose another one but i think by and large we were in accord about which takes were the best ones and that was one that seemed like a no brainer it was just so funny holy crap it's the bad guys Oh, the whole gang is here. <laughs> Time to shut down the enemy's frontline base. Let's head out. Initiating jump. Sending us out there alone just because we got the right ships. It doesn't pay to be nice, does it? Now stop whining. Our ships are too big for this one. The least you could do is send us some of your men. Keep them coming, Captain. Jokes are great today. We're at the mission yeah. area. Lots of good-natured banter. First, take out those enemy ships. All units, break and attack. You show them. <laughs> All right. So before I forget about this feature, if you pause and hit X, you can play in third person. Very easily overlooked. The the controls in the options menu do point that out, but they don't say that you have to pause the game, so you could tr you, you, uh, you could easily try pressing X and then see nothing happen and just give up. And I think that's just one of the many ways that this game is sort of a, is, is trying to flex the technology. You know, if you think about what the Saturn brought to the table. You've got this great 3D showpiece show, show that uses the Saturn's sound chip to generate this awesome soundtrack, but then also uses the CD technology to uh, have this fully voiced, you know, radio style drama playing out over top of it. Uh, and one of the cool things that 3D can do is dynamically change the camera on the fly. And so you have that trace play mode, which lets you make a cinematic replay of your of your gameplay. And then you've also got this uh, option to play in third person. And actually, uh, I don't want to die horrible. Oh wait, yeah. And so also there's there's this where it just dynamically changes the camera at random. The hard, uh, probably not a great way to play the game, but it's cool it's cool that it exists, you know? It's a flex. And probably great for capturing B-roll for our inevitable launch trailer, now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Alright, let's go back to plain old cockpit view. What I like about ship type A is that um, using your special weapon has it, almost no cost to your energy bar, whereas ship type B, um, you have to use it pretty sparingly. In my experience, anyway. So you can really mash on those lock-on uh, lasers, or whatever they're supposed to be. Lock-on missiles? Homing missiles? And use them about as liberally, li liberally as you're using the, the Vulcan laser. But... The way I'm playing it is I'm, I'm holding the laser button down and mashing A with, you know, while rolling my thumb. And I really want to be able to do it on a mission stick where you have a button panel uh, and you can just mash more comfortably. So, we'll see. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about 
assembly hacking, and very few people do because it's not the Stone Age. For what it's worth, the director of this game discovered this project organically on Twitter without us reaching out, and uh, he gave us a very nice endorsement. So uh, thank you, Tsuda-san, for the kind words. That's actually been very motivating because, you know, you just never know if you reach out because we're like putting our hands in someone else's work unsolicited but uh I want to believe that in general when you're when you're trying to bring someone's work to reach another like a new audience that they would at least be a little flattered I hope that we're doing a good enough job that they... I mean, we've already gotten commended uh, by the director on this project, so it, it, it does make me feel a lot... Well, just a lot more motivated. <clears throat> we never reached out to anyone about Bulk Slash. I was, too, I was too scared. Whoa! So, um, something that I think confuses a lot of players is between missions you have that screen where it gives you the option to save. That's not saving your progress. Uh, it's, it's saving the trace play, but I still don't totally understand how trace play works. So it's saving a replay recording. Um, you cannot save your progress mid-campaign in this game, just like Bulk Slash, which means the game was conceived to be played in a single sitting. However, Unlike Bulk Slash, this game takes about two hours to clear. Um, so it's a bit of a slog. And on top of that, you have only a few continues. I think it's like three. And at times the game can be quite hard. So there's some trial and error involved. So this may not be adding up to something very enticing <laughs> to, to you guys. Uh, but... It, it, I, I was worried about that, um, so I looked into the prospect of find you know finding some way to like cheat to get infinite continues or stage select. And what we've come up with is if you have a pro action replay or pseudo Saturn Kai, which I think most people who are playing uh, fan translations do have pseudo Saturn Kai. It's free anyway. Eagle and Falcon Squadrons, continue attacking all enemy craft and keep their forces dispersed. Hell yeah! Don't wait up if you're ready to head in. Virgil, Phil, we'll leave to clean up to you guys. Oh god. Oh, I didn't realize I'm, I was almost dead already. <laughs> what did I do? Might have to redo this mission. Um, anyway, so if you have pseudo Saturn... Oh my god! Sorry. Woo! <laughs> Guess this would be too tight for their ships. I verified the enemy's frontline base ahead. Please mind the gun turrets. Hawk Squadron, all units engage. The enemy is processing the asteroid's mineral components into energy and storing it within the central tower. Got it. All units, attack that tower. <laughs> um. What in the hell was I talking about? Oh yeah, so if you have a pro action replay or pseudo Saturn Kai, there is a cheat code that gives you infinite continues, uh, and Private Eye graciously, um, this is the developer of Pseudo Saturn, graciously helped us figure out how to use that cheat, which was very helpful in testing. And then uh, what that allowed me to do was beat the game. Uh, although I think when I finally beat the game, I didn't end up having to use more continues than I would have had anyway, but it was nice. It gave me peace of mind. Anyway, so uh, now that I've beaten the game, 
uh, I have that stage select that I was telling you guys about with the trace play mode. And so I think what we'll do is in the readme, we'll give instructions on how to activate that cheat code. And we'll also include as part of the patch package a complete save file so that those who want to have the stage select uh, can, can, can not have to beat the game with only three continues or whatever. So we're doing what we can to make the game more approachable anyway is the short of it. Yeah, like, I looked around on the... I, like, Googled the game in Japanese and found a bunch of Japanese player reviews, and most of them mentioned that aspect of the game. It's like, man, why are you going to limit continues and have unskippable cutscenes? <laughs> Which is another thing, is you can't skip the in-game dialogue. So uh, if you're... Oof. If you've just had a game over and run out of continues and you're just trying to get back to mission 12 or something. I think it could be quite frustrating if you have to sit through all the same dialogues again and what's a pretty long game. And you don't want the dialogues to be annoying, you want them to be cool. Uh, for what it's worth, you can... I'm sort of shooting myself in the foot by telling people this, but it's a cool, you know, it's cool that they included it, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, if you turn, so there are sound uh, settings, right? And you can set the volume of the sound effects, the music, and the VO all separately. Um, but fun little detail is if you set the VO volume to zero, it will actually fast, fast forward all the in-game VO sequences. Uh, meaning it will skip them. And then you're basically playing something a lot more like Stellar Assault on the uh, 32X. So if you're looking to speed run the game and you've already experienced the gripping radio drama that we've uh, painstakingly translated and recorded in English, <laughs> you can play without that. It's, it's a faster game. Uh, and I think it's just, you know, it's, a, it's cool that they added that feature in it. It is. Obviously, we want you guys to experience it with the translation. We've spent over a year on this now. Well, about a year. You guys think I can survive this with 18% shield? I think I can. But isn't this cool how you, you, tell, you uh, warp into this suddenly very cramped space after being in wide open outer space for the whole game so far. And it's a nice little showcase of uh, the Saturn's graphical capabilities, you know? You see this kind of infinite flat plane a lot in uh, 3D Saturn games. It looks cool. It looks unmistakably Saturn. I think we can do it. Steady as she goes. Oop. One more flyby. So I kind of do this, like, I don't know what you call this flight pattern where you, like, you fly toward it and then, like, pull a U turn. And Detecting a series of strong readings originating from the center of the tower. It is dangerous. Everybody out. Short jumps. Do a short jump. I never get tired of this warp effect. This game, I don't know what this game is like on the twin stick. Every game, uh, as far as I know, can detect the twin stick because it just detects it as a regular pad. Whether it's comfortably playable or not, I haven't, I haven't tried out yet, but I will. But uh, the thing is, I feel like this game is not a particularly good fit for the twin stick. It's an obvious fit for the mission stick, which was made for flight sim games. Well, actually, it was packaged with Space Harrier, but it's it's a no-brainer. Anyway, so that's the demo. Um, that's what we've done so far, basically. 
Well, I think that's uh, that's it for Stellar Assault. We still got an hour to kill, so I guess let's play some Sega Saturn. Uh, but that's the that's the state of the project, and now that the holidays are behind us, we're kicking back into gear. I'm starting to uh, get in in contact with our actors again and uh, set up more recording sessions. I think we're about 80% done with the VO recording. Um, there's still a lot of timelines left I have to make, and then I'll pass those to Shadow Mask for processing. Uh, but we're we're moving it right along, you know, it's going well. Knock on wood. There's some wood behind me. Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna put on something else. 